you have to hear it if you want to experience a reaching out or within meeting that has the power to transform lives. Reaching Out From Within is a self-help program for incarcerated men and women in every Kansas prison. The men and women who choose to participate meet weekly and they will file into a bare room with plastic chairs. The women are wearing long cotton pants and a t-shirt with a number. And the men wear blue jeans and a blue shirt and they wear a number. And they all are carrying the blue book. Ta-da. The blue book was created by a man who was serving a life sentence. And he wanted to understand the roots of violence in his life. So he asked if I could find some people that would come to the prison and talk about child abuse, spouse abuse, sexual abuse, substance abuse, addiction, anger management, conflict resolution, communication skills, and a lot of other topics. And everybody that I invited went to the prison and gave a workshop. And Greg remembered everything they said, and he started teaching a course. The thing is that he came up with is after every paragraph that had some information on these topics, he would ask a question. And in the blue book, they're printed in italics. And every question in italics is the kind of question that a psychiatrist would ask. But there is no therapist in the room. They only have each other to heal themselves each other. So, if you are not absolutely determined to examine the core of your being, don't come to one of these meetings. If you are not willing to be brutally vulnerable, to share your deepest fears and regrets, don't show up. This program is not for people who lack the courage to an effective program in prison is measured by recidivism. Recidivism is a word that's used to describe the process of when somebody is released and then they have to come back in. The national recidivism in this country is between 50 and 67 percent. Between 50 and 67% of all people who enter the prison and are released come back in again. But reaching out from within, the people who attend this program, the recidivism data is between 8 and 22%. Volunteers like myself who attend these weekly meetings sit in silent awe of the discussions that are so raw, real, and relevant. I'll give you an example. I was at a meeting one evening, and the word atonement came up. And someone said, well, what, what is? How do you define atonement? And somebody else said, well, we don't get to define it. Society does. If you commit a certain crime, you will spend a certain amount of time. And then somebody spoke up and said, but we all know people who serve their time and they never atone for their crime. And then somebody else said, and we all know people who atoned a long time ago and have never been released. <sighs> the member of Reaching Out From Within, who was facilitating this discussion, noticed that there was a man sitting in a chair, and he was in agony. He, w he was squirming. He, he could tell that there was something really going on. So he walked over and he said to Damien, Damien, what's going on with you? I, I can see that you're, you're really upset. And Damien said, I can never atone. 
When I was 18, I killed a man who was 18, and it doesn't make any difference what I do or how long I spend here. I can never bring him back to life. And there was silence in the room. And CJ walked over, stood in front of Damien and said, Damien, I destroyed two people's lives. I killed a woman and I kept a seven-year-old daughter from having a mother. He said for decades, I wallowed in my guilt and my shame. I was just consumed with what I had done. And one day I looked in the mirror and I said, I'm still here. My life has been spared. What am I going to do to deserve this life that I have? And he said, I thought to myself about all the people in this prison who were in pain. And I thought to myself, if I could just get out of myself, forgive myself, and be available to other people, I could deserve this life. He said, Damien, if you decide that you want to forgive yourself and become of service to others, you know where my bunk is. Just come on over. I'll be available to you 24-7. Another story. Members of Reaching Out From Within who are in minimum security at Lansing are given permission to leave the prison and talk to juvenile offenders in Olathe. And um, the staff of the juvenile offender facility says that when the inmates come and interact with those kids, it is the most effective thing that happens for those kids. So they are also allowed to go to high schools and talk to students, as long as it's in Kansas. So three of our members came to Shawnee Mission North. And J-Dub got up, and J-Dub said, well, let me tell you how it was. When I grew up, my parents both worked full time. I was pretty much on my own all the time. One day, I went to my parents and I said, could I have a dollar? For a dollar, I could get a soda pop, a bag of chips, and a candy bar. And that sounded pretty good to me. And my mother and father said, no, you can't. So I went out and I walked in the front yard and I looked up the street where I always looked and I saw all those guys with jewelry and fancy cars and girlfriends and I thought, that looks a lot better to me than where I am. He said, so I went up and I became part of that group and I started selling drugs. He said, but I got caught and they sent me to prison. Said I got out, but the only thing I knew how to do to survive was to sell drugs. So I got caught and I went back to prison again. Guess what? Got out third time. When you do it three times, you're in prison for 25 years. Said I've already served 20 and I've got five more to go. And a student raised his hand and said, J. Dub. Don't you think that's terribly unfair that you have to spend 25 years in prison for a victimless crime? And J-Dub went over to him and he said, my crime was not victimless. I sold drugs to people like your parents. Those parents that I sold drugs to spent all their money getting high and paying me. They were not available to their children. Those children are my victim. One more story. If you want to become a member of Reaching Out From Within, you're usually recruited by somebody who's already a member, and you can come to a meeting and sit three times and never say a word, except at the beginning of every meeting, you have to join in the beliefs and goals which says, we are committed to nonviolence. We will find alternatives to solve problems without using violence. And then you give a positive thought, and then you can just sit. 
But if you want to, at the fourth meeting, you have to give an icebreaker. So you have to stand up and you have to um, tell something about your life, something about your family, your history, your crime, how long you've been in prison, how long you're going to be in prison. So this young man, I would say he's in his early 50s. That's pretty young to me because I'm 85, so 50 looks very young to me. So he stood up there and he said, when I was eight years old, my parents got a divorce. Now, my father was never around, so that was no big loss. But my mother was an alcoholic, so social services put me in foster care. And in those days, the philosophy of foster care was you could only stay with one foster family for nine months. Because if you stayed much longer, the foster family might grow to like you. They might even love you. They might want to adopt you. And then that family wouldn't be available to take foster children. So every nine months, James was sent to another foster family and to another school. And no male figure in any of those homes ever reached out to him, tried to make a connection. I'm sure they all felt, well, he's gone pretty soon, so no sense in trying to bother. This went on year after year after year. He was a lonely isolate in the families that he stayed with and in school. When he was 16, he got sent to another foster family, got sent to a new school. He walked in and a gang came up and invited him to join. He was thrilled. He said, I never had anybody invite me to belong to anything. I, I, I couldn't believe it. It was so wonderful. He said, what I didn't know was that there was going to be an initiation rite that I was going to have to be involved in, and there was going to be a murder. So I came into prison when I was 16. And I've handled prison the same way I handled on the outside. I have no social skills. I've been alone all my life. Two years ago, a 16-year-old boy came into prison, and I looked at him, and I saw myself. And he said, whenever I could, I just went over to his bunk, and he would talk, and I would just listen. And I listened. And I listened. And he said, two weeks ago, he got released. And before he left, he came over to where I was, and he took my hand. And he said, I want to thank you for making a difference in my life. And James said, I have never made a difference in anybody's life. Never made a difference in my own life. But I have heard that in this program, reaching out from within, you make a difference in each other's lives. I want to have that feeling again. I have been doing these weekly meetings for 35 years, and I have changed as dramatically as all of those people in reaching out from within. I have learned to be much less judgmental. I never want to know anyone's crime I don't want to know something that might keep me from loving them the way I do. Sometimes, as part of a meeting, somebody will confess to something that is very painful for me to hear. And they only do it because they think it might be best for somebody in that room. They could learn something from the confession. But I think that even if I did hear it at the very beginning, I might still be able to love them because I'm in the presence of men and women who want to become of value. They want to change so they can go back to their families and they can be better children, they can be better parents, they can be more loving spouses. They want to be of value. How can I not love people who are making that journey? So the second thing I've learned is that I believe that everybody is redeemable. I believe there is an angel and a beast in each of us. 
And I believe if we don't take the effort to face the demons inside of us, we won't be able to nurture the angel. I have learned about resilience. I have watched human being after human being transcend becoming a number, losing their identity, facing daily injustices, and they still have hope for the future. They still believe they have something to give to this world. And when I go home in my car, I ask myself the questions that are in italics. Two months ago, I had an opportunity to go to Germany and to go to a prison. I had seen a television program that showed prisons in Germany that are so humane, it was unimaginable. I decided I had to see it. I went. The head of the prison gave me his card, Ariel Brimley. It doesn't say warden, it says social pedagogue. A pedagogue is an educator, a teacher. The German prison system believes that the minute you enter the prison, their whole purpose is to help you leave in a way that you can be productive and come into society and fit and become all that you ever needed to be. So you wear your own clothes. You have a little room that's kind of like a dorm room, but you have a key to your own room. At the end of one hall, there's a little mini kitchen because they want you to learn how to cook so you'll be able to survive. At the other end of the hall, there are social workers that are there to help you deal with your issues. The guards, who are not called guards, they're called pedagogues, have no guns, no billy clubs. They carry no weapons. And the inmates don't fear them. They look up to them because they're trying to help them become productive, successful citizens. Can you imagine this kind of humane system coming to this country? Can you imagine that this country that is so committed to punishing and dehumanizing people who enter, that it could ever change and be that way? It will never happen in my lifetime, but it could happen in yours. If some of you, if all of you in this audience would think about using your life, your energy, having a passion, to make this world a safer place. The recidivism rate for murderers in that prison is 5%. It proves its success. We just need people who will make policies like that. That could be you. Please, do whatever you can to make this world a safer place. Thank you very, very much.